I would like to welcome you to the webinar called Careers Outside Academia, Researchers at Risk and Transitions to Other Sectors. Uh, we will wait a little bit for people to uh, enter the webinar and then we'll start shortly. Okay, I think we will start now this webinar. Uh, this is a webinar in um, the Inspire Europe project, which is uh, an uh, EU funded project under the Maurice Glodowska Career Actions. Uh, it is an initiative to support, promote and integrate researchers at risk in Europe. It has 10 partners coming together to uh, assist researchers at risk. And researchers at risk are researchers who have been hindered from doing their uh, research in their home country. And in this webinar, we will be looking at the topic, careers outside academia, researchers at risk and transitions to other sectors. The two main target groups for this webinar are researchers at risk themselves, uh, normally staying in Europe, hosted in a host organization in Europe in some sort of um, temporary uh, position or a fellowship, and also the host institution representatives, uh, either from higher education institutions or other uh, organizations. Uh, the webinar will last for uh, 75 minutes. Uh, and if you have questions to the speakers in this webinar, uh, we will ask you to use the Q&A uh, possibility uh, in Zoom. Write your questions there. Uh, we will then, um, I will present the speakers in this webinar. Uh, they are uh, Teresa Fernandez, uh, product manager in the Gradient Tech AB and board member of the Euroscience. Dr. Mehmet Alpaslan Koruglu, construction site manager in Yevleport. Dr. Kenneth McKenzie, research lead in human science studio at the DOC, which is Accenture's global center for innovation. Then Professor Nina Worms, professor in history of technology at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. And then Dr. Beate Scholz, founder and managing director of Scholz CTC GmbH. I will just give a few uh, comments before I will leave the floor to the speakers. Uh, the topic that we are discussing today uh, is about where to go after you have been in a temporary position or fellowship. And uh, it's very important to start the planning early. I'm sure you will hear more about this from the speakers. Uh, and I just wanted to remind you that there are many different alternatives after a host placement. Some people can return home to their home country if that is safe. Uh, it is possible to uh, apply for positions inside academia, positions outside academia, to start your own business or to look for external funding. It's also possible for uh, sometimes to uh, get a new fellowship for researchers at risk. And in some uh, cases, it is even uh, necessary to apply for asylum and then continue job search. In this webinar, we will look at how to work to get positions outside academia in the same country or in another country. So this is what we will be discussing. I just wanted to uh, give you, show you this uh, picture. It's not about researchers at risk, but it shows uh, quite clearly uh, how uh, researchers are spread out. This is actually only for Norway. This shows that six years after the um, PhD, uh, only around 30% were in higher education, uh, while uh, around 20% were actually in the private sector. Another big group were in research institutes and also university hospitals. So this shows that for any uh, researcher after PhD, there are many different uh, possibilities for what will happen next. I will then uh, go back uh, to having uh, all the panelists up. 
sorry. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. Um, so um, now I will leave uh, uh, over to the speakers and we will uh, start with uh, Teresa. And um, I hope, Teresa, uh, that you will share some of your experience. You have not been a researcher at risk, but you have experience with moving from one country to another and from academia to uh, another sector. Uh, so please, could you tell us about your experience? Yes, and thank you, Marit, for this kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone uh, to this, to this uh, webinar. And uh, what I would like to say first is that uh, I come from a background of uh, biomedicine and uh, neuroscience. That's where I did my, my PhD. I did it in, uh, in Sweden. And I'm now working at a biotech company uh, and I work uh, at the interface between research and development and marketing where I try to implement new diagnostics uh, into the market. And so I also had to do a transition between my field of research. I went from neuroscience to microbiology. And I must say that without the skills that I uh, gained throughout my PhD, that would have been impossible. And I know that many times one thinks that, okay, I don't have so many skills or I have very limited skills that are very uh, sort of say determined but uh, there's a lot of things that are actually transferable for example the ability to uh, conduct research or plan studies being able to to deliver results work in teams and so forth uh, that has been very important for me in the work that i do today um at the same time, just because I'm very driven by curiosity and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do after my PhD, since uh, it wasn't going as planned, really, I decided to get involved into other activities. Uh, so I became editor-in-chief for the, for the student magazine that we had. And I was also involved in the organization of the Brain Awareness Week. So I was basically coordinating the, the fair, uh, the science fair that was uh, in the streets in Stockholm. And I just wanted to try out those experiences. And it turned out that even though they were very different in nature, I gained skills that were also very crucial for, for the job that I have today. And actually in the interview, they told me that those skills that I had acquired were also very important uh, for giving me the job one thing that I didn't have the opportunity to do, uh, and I would recommend those of you that may have that opportunity, is to perhaps do an internship. If you already know that you want to work in the private sector, I think it's important. And I think one should not look at the role, at what the project that you're given is for those two, three months or whatsoever, but see it as an opportunity of being exposed to something else and trying to like soak up all the information understand how the private sector works because that was something that I had no idea about when I started to, to look for jobs. So I realized that uh, I didn't get any of these internships because I didn't speak the local language. So I didn't speak Swedish at the time when I was doing my PhD. And I realized then that that was a hinder for me to move forward in my career. At the same time, since I was doing the PhD and I was involved in all these other activities, I realized that I had no time left to focus on the language. So what I did is that I decided to focus on the PhD, finish my PhD, and after that, take some time out to learn the language and to start to really brainstorm about what kind of a job do I wanna get and where am I headed? So for me, this point of self-reflection and understanding who you are and, and your core values were extremely important. So one of the things that I was doing is that I was scanning my network, the contacts that I had, and looking at where they work now and doing some research about those companies and then seeing how that would fit with what I want to do. So for example, I found a company that is trying to work against the issue of antibiotic resistance which is a big issue for the world, as well as saving lives. So, so that resonated with me. And it, it's a small company, so that resonated also with me, since I didn't have so much knowledge about 
what I want to do in the future. Uh, so that gave me the flexibility of moving around in the company and doing a little bit of everything. And I also love to work in teams. So this was really a good fit for me. But for example, if you're a person that likes to work remotely or you know exactly what you want to do, what kind of position you want to have, maybe an international company could fit you better or an organization, maybe where English is the common language and so forth. So I think it's really important that you get involved early, as soon as you can. Uh, your PhD is extremely important, but if you're curious about things, just go and seek those things. And uh, yes, get to know who you are. That's really important. And, and see it as, what can I offer to those employ employers? What can I give to them rather than, oh, what can I get from them? So thank you very much. And I leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you, Teresa. Our next speaker will be Dr. Mehmed Aplas Koroglu. Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Uh, who is a construction site manager at Yevleport. Uh, you have been a researcher at risk. Uh, and uh, I hope you can share some of your experience of moving uh, into the private sector. Uh, maybe you have some common experiences with uh, Teresa, or maybe they're very different. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, we have similar experiences with Dr. Teresa. Uh, firstly, I have started my uh, academic career in Turkey, and I worked as an assistant professor. In uh, 2019, I, I had to uh, leave my country, and uh, I have been a former scholars at risk and scholar rescue from currently and I work uh, in KTH as a researcher for one year. Uh, it was hard for me to find a permanent position in Sweden in academia. Therefore, I started to look for positions outside academia. And uh, I was lucky because for engineering field, there, there were several research positions outside academia. Also, it's, it's for science, technology, and mathematic fields. Uh, for example, I applied RICE uh, Research Institute of Sweden uh, for different positions, but I, I, I haven't been accepted for the positions that I applied. And I think uh, local language was barrier for me there. Uh, as Teresa said, yeah, uh, it is, it's, it's not a must, but uh, I strongly suggest to learn local language, uh, especially in, in Sweden. Uh, from my experience, uh, I would like to emphasize that it's a very tiring and difficult period. And so I believe that it's better to ask for help from uh, some specialized organizations and labor unions or public agencies. And I did it. And, uh, they really tried to help me uh, during uh, my uh, position researching. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, I think network is very essential. Yeah. Uh, uh, because in Sweden, uh, you can you can have a very essential, a very impressive CV, but uh, network is very important according to my uh, experience. Additionally, yeah, of course, you, you need to have an impressive CV uh, and a professional so social media network is, uh, is strongly needed, yeah, because people in Sweden uh, really looks uh, LinkedIn too much for. Uh, and finding for a new position can be uh, time confusing and ex exhausting for, but uh, you have many advantages such as a higher education background, self-confidence and experience in your field. So do not forget that you have been researching and teaching in your subject for many years. And this means, yeah, you know your subject well and uh, do not hesitate to show it. And to sum up, uh, to have a good network both inside and outside academia can open doors for you for new positions outside academia. 
And I suggest to communicate also with specialized organizations, labor unions, or public agencies. And of course, you can ask for help from uh, scholars at risk or scholar rescue fund or etc. And I did it. And uh, especially scholar rescue fund really helped me too much uh, in this issue. And uh, and they are very open to help to threaten scholars every time. And please uh, finally never give up. Yeah, this is so essential. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mehmet. Uh, so uh, for your uh, CV, you said it's important about your CV. Did you change your CV or add things to your CV during your time in Sweden uh, that you think were particularly important? Sorry, I couldn't understand. Um, for you, you said your CV is very important. Uh, did you make changes or addition, did you add things to your CV during your time first year in Sweden that you think were particularly important yes, for course. getting your uh, position outside? Yeah, I had some, yes. Okay, so more on research and publications, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. my advantage were especially, uh, I also worked in uh, industry in Turkey during my research, so it yeah. was an advantage for me. Of course, that was an advantage. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Kenneth McKenzie, uh, who we have asked to uh, say a little bit more from the employer side, uh, uh, because we're interested in also hearing more about a company. What are you looking for when you are uh, searching for people who have a PhD and have this kind of high competency? Uh, how do you see this from your side? Okay. Thanks for that, Marit. Um, morning, everyone, or afternoon as well, wherever you may be. Um, my background is slightly different, I would imagine, from many of the people attending the call in that I did an undergraduate in psychology and then a PhD in political science. So I'm not a hard scientist. I've, I'm not a programmer. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an accountant. And being, I'd say, frank, in most cases, it's quite easy to imagine job paths. I'm not saying it's easy to get jobs, but it's easy to imagine job paths if you have uh, lab science-based skills or engineering skills. It's harder to imagine it if you have social science skills. I work in the DOC, which is Accenture's Global Center for Innovation. And Accenture has about six or seven more, really, of centers of innovation around the world. And why it's important for us to have people who aren't just Caucasian, who aren't just Anglophonic, is that we're we're working with clients globally for consumers and businesses globally in a business to business sense as well. And as a simple idea, what I think is quite true is it's very hard to design something for someone unless you design something with someone. And that's true for business platforms as well. So Accenture is, is truly global and uh, multilingual and I mean, even even in my Dublin is a relatively small city on the big stage, uh, but we have um, I think we've we've 30 nationalities represented in the doc, um, which is interesting for such a small city that wouldn't be regarded as a global city. So uh, th I think that's the first thing Accenture is and other companies like Accenture, which are effectively like tech consulting, recognize it, it makes a lot more sense to design things with people than just for people. And that means you need to understand context. Now, that's what that's the cultural openness of Accenture. I think the second thing is thinking about what can you bring that helps you move more readily into Accenture and organizations like Accenture. The first thing to bear in mind is that like I have found a lot of cases that transferable skills work is done with PhD students and postdoctoral scholars in some universities in high income countries but it's patchy. I think one of the reasons for that is a lot of the people who, um, I, and I say this with the greatest of respect, but universities is, is the last place to be disrupted in the job market. So what people hope for is they get an undergrad and they get a PhD, and then they stay in the system and never leave it. It's very hard to leave academia and go back into academia for a prestigious tenure track role. I mean, that's almost unheard of. There are some disciplines, and maybe Mehmet's will be an example, where you can go in and out of academia. But in most cases, 
the academic model in high income countries is you finish at 22 and 23 and you stay there till you're 65. That's what the elite academics have done. They've never left. So it's, I think it's very hard for institutions run by elite academics to then say, well, here's what you need to do to succeed in the non-academic world. At the very least, it's a challenge in empathy because they often, the people who tell you this have never done it themselves. And that's not a criticism of them. It's just illustrating an empathy gap that could exist. The second thing to bear in mind is, and I'm gonna use the phrase, learn the language, not in a sense of uh, you know, cultural arrogance, far from it. Learn the language means there's a language of business. Now, if you are, for example, a programmer, or if you're a physicist or an engineer, and you can use Python and R and data visualization, it's it's relatively easy to get work, I would suggest, relatively easy, based on what I've seen on, on, on movements within Accenture. If, on the other hand, you are trying to, something is not as immediately clickable into that world, then you need to understand how business people think. One of the main things, the biggest difference I think between the word of business and academia is business wants to solve problems. Academia likes solving problems, but also likes finding problems. That's the nature of research. The world of business is often less interested in finding problems. They just want to do what the client wants or what the problem needs. So in other words, it's always problem solution mode. You spend much less time and much fewer cognitive resources, in my view, on problem framing and problem finding. And I'm not saying that's right. But that's a major psychocultural difference between business and academia. Business is really about delivering solutions. Academia is often about finding there's a problem with this theory. Let's play with this problem and see where that goes. I, in terms of, I think the idea of thinking about, Theresa made a very good point. It can be really hard to get internships. I accept that. But it's useful for you to see, is, am, I going to, am I going to enjoy working in this world? One thing I would suggest to you, if at all you can, if you're in an academic role or another role, is how can you begin to do a tiny, tiny bit of what we call SME consulting, subject matter expert consulting. So Accenture and other major consultancies and smaller consultancies rely a lot on subject matter experts who don't work in the company. And if you get the chance to do even four or five hours work, even in the emails they write with you, you will see differences in the, their worldview. You'll see differences in their deadlines. You'll see differences in their sense of collegiality or not. And that will give you a good representative sample of the difference between academia and teamwork. Uh, academia and teamwork. And teamwork is much more common in business. Um, that's not to say teamwork doesn't happen in academia. Of course it does. But again, it's even in academia, it's easier to imagine the team in a biochemistry lab than it is maybe in an economics department. It's still, still, still solar research, a laptop is a viable model of work in the world of academia. It's an impossible model of work in the world of work. So oftentimes when the big cultural gaps is you, you are in a situation where your work is named, you know, the journal article, the research grant, even if you're not lead author, you're middle author, or if you're very lucky, you are lead author and so on and so forth. In the world of business, you may, write, you may do work that never has your name in it. And that's a really interesting challenge to what you may have grown up with in the world of academia, where we are thinking really of authorship. We, we think like novelists, we think like composers. That mindset is often doesn't work in the world of business where it's like, what has Accenture done for you as a client? We use that kind of phraseology rather than what has Dr. Kenneth McKenzie done for you? Most people don't, will never know who I am. And that sense of anonymity around your work is a challenge if you've been used to being recognized for your work. Um, for me, they're, they're the main difference is learning that language, understanding the subject matter expertise route is very helpful. Reading a Harvard Business Review and seeing how they talk about things, the kind of vocabulary they use, the way they present problems. The fact that in business, very few people are trained to think statistically or empirically. They, they get bits of it, but they don't really disentangle correlation and causation very well, for example. Most business people who you meet may understand statistics, but could probably not do regression modeling or the com a computer program linked to that. If you bring in that world into your world of work, you either have to explain it to them or not show it to them and just say, trust me, I've done it. So again, that's another, in academia, it's always like, show me your work. Sometimes the business is just show me the answer. 
So that's again another psychocultural challenge to be able to surmount. And I think I'll leave it at there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. I think you uh, gave us some of the very interesting uh, cultural and psychological uh, differences uh, that the researchers need to uh, meet with uh, when uh, moving from academia to other sectors. One of our uh, uh, participants, uh, one of our um, yeah, participants uh, asked the question about um, networking and uh, what can we do uh, if we are in uh, um, uh, social sciences in humanities and so on. And I think then I would leave the floor to Nina Worms, who's a professor at the KTH. And you are a historian. And I think maybe you can have some uh, thoughts around how uh, people in social science and the humanities uh, can uh, work with this uh, shift, both in uh, culture and also in uh, what you will actually uh, do to get on to another sector. Please, Nina. Thank you, Marit. Um, thank you all um, for um, inviting me. And uh, I must say, to begin with saying that I'm, I'm happy for the order in which we decided to do this because I connect, I think, <laughs> with Kenneth very well. And I've been, the, the, my contribution has been prepared good by, by Teresa and Mehmet also. So yes, uh, I was actually trained as an engineer, but then I turned to history. And I'm trying to do what Kenneth says is really hard. Uh, and that is to, to teach our PhD students uh, all who cannot stay in academia because there are not enough positions in academia for PhD students. What they actually know and uh, what kind of skills they have that they can use when they leave academia and go into civil society or the private sector with their skills as historians of technology and environment. Um, and I'm going to say a few things uh, about that here. Uh, um, basically, there are two issues, and they connect very well with both Teresa Mehmet and Kenneth. Uh, I think that you need to articulate your skills, and I think you need to know your audience. These two things are actually, uh, they hang together very, very well, uh, more than you might think, but they're also really separate activities. Uh, we might regard skills differently, um, and there are a few ways of knowing how they relate to the audience, but if you begin by returning to your training and list the things that you were actually formally or informally trained to do, uh, you will find that there are more than you thought of to begin with. Among them, as a social scientist or humanities scholar, there will be the ability to find reliable material on various subjects. A key skill for a scholar is to find information that can be used and combined. You might not realize, but this is actually a skill. Read and assess large amounts of written text in a short period of time is another skill that is not something that everybody has. A researcher in the humanities and social sciences is a good and efficient reader. And this is something that you need to, to realize. Furthermore, to summarize this reading orally or in written form for yourself or for others is uh, moreover a skill. Uh, this uh, material furthermore needs to be presented to someone, right? And if you've been teaching, which is something that you practiced in academia, if you are lucky as a PhD student or a postdoc, this is also something that you've been trained to do for specific audiences, but also audience where you might not be sure who knows what. So you've actually, if you've been teaching some, you've also been able to try and uh, adapt your um, uh, teaching and information to the varying uh, degrees of knowledge of your audience. You have probably also practiced as a humanist, humanist and social science scholar to sustain an argument, to argue, uh, to find viable ways of reasoning. Think about what that means in forms of skills. You might be analytic and structured, which are good and uh, um, viable um, skills uh, in many settings. But a good scholar also needs to be creative and find new solutions, as, as Kenneth was talking about. Actually, solutions can also come about by uh, asking new questions or being able to perspectivize. That is to look at things from a new and other angle. It's a very useful ability in an open organization that wants to innovate and develop. 
Having done a PhD, you also know how to plan and execute a large project. Teresa mentioned that. Um, depending on your, the context of your research and early employment, there might be other things that you were trained to do, but you don't realize there are specific skills. You might have relied on interviewing people. Uh, that is an experience that you might want to mention or think about what it, uh, what it does for your overall ability and, and, um, and uh, practices. You might have worked in teams, as was mentioned, or been very autonomous. Both might be of interest and result in specific skills, depending on what kind of organization you're looking for. You need to think about how to articulate and frame these, these abilities. Uh, it's always true, so to, to my other point, to, that you should know your audience. But when you leave academia, as we've already heard, it is even more true. You constantly need to find out what you can expect of your audience in terms of language and knowledge. What do they expect from you? What might they need from you? How much do they know about the skills that you might have? And what do you need to articulate? I'd like to use the word translation to describe the work you need to do. You need to translate yourself to the ones you're interested in talking to. This translational process should not be understood as a language issue, even though language, as we've heard, is often key for communication to work. But I rather think about this as a broader process. It is important, however, as Teresa was pointing to, that you, the original, must be, remain as intact as possible. You should not change yourself when you present who you are. But it's, it's vital that you realize that it is your responsibility to know your audience so that you can make sure that your skills become known to those you talk to. So finally, even if it should go without saying, it also means that you need to know yourself, like Teresa was saying. So to sum up, revisit your training and practice to identify your professional and personal skills. They are there, even though you don't see them in the context you're now. Articulate them, get to know your audience and think seriously about what they need to know and what you can offer and translate yourself to them. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, this was very interesting and I hope it was also helpful for those people who, both those who are in social sciences and humanities, but also more generally. Uh, one of our um, uh, in the audience uh, actually asked the question of how can one uh, choose between passion and working in private companies? But actually you said that one should not uh, change oneself, uh, I mean, shift totally. So uh, do you have any comment to that before we go on? Well, maybe Kenneth wants to answer that, but I think actually that uh, I think that if you are in academia and you, you do um, service to society, which many of us do, we will get caught in other places and there's no lack of passion, neither in the public <laughs> nor the private sector. So uh, the passion can be found in many places. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to comment on that, Kent, before we go on? Yeah, I, again, I, I, I don't know so much about history and maybe humanities, but I, I've met lot, like, lots of my friends are academics. I have done academia as well. And lots of people I meet are obsessed by the subject and less about the, the thinking skills. So they are really only interested in uh, late Reformation Europe and they're not interested in even the Industrial Revolution. Now, I know that's a gross generalization, <laughs> but they're absolutely married to the subject. So one thing I, I, I deal a lot with psychology graduates and psychology graduates say, but I wanted to do mental health. Or I want to do neuroscience. And I said, but if you want to understand how people do things, looking at what they do in the world of business or on Google or on Facebook, that's p human behavior too. But lots of psychology graduates say, but that's not the human behavior I think. So they, 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 they decide mentally to not, to not participate in that. And I understand that. For them, maybe because they've had particularly strong and impressive lectures, psychology is only mental health or is only neuroscience. So it's it, it's this, whether you view an undergraduate education or postgrad as a toolkit or as just the book you always want to read. Yeah. OK, good. So uh, we use the tool case and widen up a little bit then. Uh, we have one more speaker who hasn't been able to say anything yet. This is Beate Scholz. Uh, you are a consultant, but you are, have also particularly been working uh, in the Inspire Europe project with 
coaching a number of researchers at risk who are looking for their next career steps. And I think it will be very interesting to hear uh, what experiences you have learned from this work. Your floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marit, for the kind introduction. Thank you for to the previous speakers. I can nicely relate to, to your statements. Maybe I should also add a short footnote on my personal trajectory. I'm also a historian by training. Then I switched into research management also with the idea to kind of try and help shape conditions in a way that make it easier to, to pursue a research career. And then I founded my own company also with the idea to help research, for instance, funding institutions to create conditions that are favorable to, to researchers' careers. So what I would like to share with you now is, as Marit has mentioned, informed partly by uh, being responsible for running the, the coaching program within the Inspire Your Framework. And also it's um, informed by a career tracking exercise that we've been participating in throughout Europe that wasn't focusing particularly on scholars at risk, but on postdocs in a more general sense. Now, um, one of the first statements I would like to share with you is the motto to um, help you to widen your scope. I think this, this matter has been addressed by a number of speakers before. And um, that could, if, you're, if we're talking about a research career, also mean think beyond the ivory tower of, of the research university, looking also to, towards other institutions. Like Marit has pointed out before, there are people who are working in non-university research institutions, but still doing research in a public uh, realm. There are people who have gained some practical experience and then apply to universities of applied sciences, which exists in a number of countries. There are people who, uh, who switch to, towards colleges for instance, teacher training colleges. There are others, and that applies mainly to the sciences, uh, who work in uh, core facilities, who run large research infrastructures. And eventually, and of course, that's, that's very important. And we have seen that also from previous speakers who are working in research and development in companies. So that's, that's a wide realm. Still, uh, you can think beyond research and development. And um, what I'm pointing out now plays especially a role for the arts, humanities and social sciences, but also for, for some, some other fields. Um, I, I couldn't agree more than with uh, Teresa and Kenneth uh, to do an internship is an invaluable source of in information because then you get an in-depth insight and you feel the flavor of such an institution. Be it that you uh, are interested, for instance, in research management, also in, in, in public research, there's a lot of needs for, for able managers. So especially people who are good project managers and, and so on have good communication skills. That's something that is required also in research management. Or human resources departments in companies, for instance. Increasingly, there's also companies that have a focus on corporate social responsibility. And that's also an important field to work in, especially um, if you adopt what, what Kenneth has, has highlighted before, understanding the context is an important issue because if you are a company, but you don't know what actually uh, concerns those people that you want to focus on in your corporate social responsibilities, then it's, it's essential to have the target uh, group perspective. And that would also play a role, for instance, for think tanks that provide um, uh, evidence and, and support to governments so that they can take informed decisions. Not to forget about the whole field of social work and, and also becoming a teacher if, at schools, especially if you're uh, also a good, good lecturer. These are all um, fields, additional fields that one might work in, especially if you have a background in the arts, humanities and social sciences. The next point that I would like to make is get aware of your own skills. And I think this has been highlighted by, by, by almost all speakers before. And um, being able, as Nina has phrased it, to translate your skills. So I would like to copy you in the chat now um, a number of links that are 
directing you to um, institutions and, and skills networks that hopefully you should see here now. Um, so these help you to gain an overview of what you're good in. Um, so what you're able to do and then translate them and Anna being knowing what your skills are, then you're able also to analyze job adverts correspondingly and also to phrase your your own narrative about your own trajectory. I think this is also a key asset if you're able to uh, talk about your own profile, your experience in the light of such skills and make it your own personal story. I think usually it's um, people also from recruiting departments are very interested in your, your own story and how that might relate to the institution. Uh, of course, knowing the local language is an essential bit. Um, I'm just repeating here what others have stated. Final point, and I think this has also come up in the, um, in the questions that I've seen so far, um, how to enlarge your network. And that could be uh, either that you contact um, career development um, institutions within your host institution that help you to you know, link with others outside academia, or you're also getting in touch with alumni of your organization that you might have been funded through. I think this is also an invaluable resource. So um, having said that, I'm looking forward to our further discussion and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think there was a lot of interesting uh, thoughts in there as well. Um, we have started getting uh, a number of questions from the audience uh, and um, I, I have one um, question that came for uh, Mehmet uh, from uh, one who is, uh, do you feel bad that you left academia after having an assistant professorship? And I will add another question from another uh, part of the audience uh, asking that, I, I had problems that uh, when I presented my full CV, uh, I people would think that I was kind of too highly qualified. While if I try to take out things, people would ask, why do you have uh, uh, holes in your CV? So the first question about how you felt, uh, it goes to Mehmet. The other one goes to you as well as to uh, the rest of the panel, if someone wants to uh, talk to that one because I think this is really a, a question that a lot of people uh, ask. So first Mehmet and I'll have Teresa. Uh, yes, uh, for Sasa's question, yes, I do feel bad uh, because, you know, I have been working for more than maybe 15 years in my subject and I had a trauma in my country and it was hard to, you know, uh, change from academia to uh, industry or, you yeah, out of academia, uh, but I, I, I still, uh, I still feel that I, I'm an academician. Yeah, I, I'm still reading papers. I'm still trying to write papers, and 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 my scope is to to teach in, in also in Sweden uh, after I learn Swedish fluently. And the second question is yes, uh, it's right because you have a highly uh, qualified CV and it's it's sometimes really hard to find a job with that with that highly uh, qualified CV and but yeah uh, we have to write it because we, we we worked on that issues and we have to write all the things in our CV uh, but it's really hard yeah I know yeah thank you very much so maybe uh, if you have all those um high qualifications in your CV, maybe then the supporting letter will be where you have to tell a story where you can show that you're also ready to uh, to start in a different uh, level, for example. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, you would like to say something on this topic as well. Yes, I think even I have myself come across this about being overqualified without even realizing it. So when I started applying for jobs, I was applying for entry level jobs because I was thinking like, I know nothing about industry. So I'm just an entry level person. And uh, what I found out afterwards was that I shouldn't actually be applying for those positions where 
you're not asked to have a PhD, for example, because they would be, at least in life sciences, they would consider you too qualified to maybe be pipetting in a lab. They, they know that you can do so much more and they don't want to take the risk of having you there because they know that you're going to get bored. So they don't want to take the risk. So I think uh, when you look for your job applications, if you find jobs on LinkedIn or where, wherever, inspect really well what they're looking for, what are the requirements and what are the desired traits. And I think that you always, always need to tailor your CV to that particular application because sometimes we, we have a lot of skills and maybe at least in the life sciences, you may know like 20 different techniques, but maybe that job is only looking for a particular field of information and, and these three or four techniques, try to bring up those experiences then. And well, uh, in my case, I actually leave out the publication record. And what I have done is that I have brought up my thesis in the interview uh, because I don't think anyone has maybe the time to look at that. And they sort of take it for granted that, of course, you are a trained researcher. So obviously you have publications. It's just, you know, sometimes less is more and, and being, being more to the point in a CV and putting in the words and the things that they're looking for, it can really help you to get that interview. And then in the interview, just to, to put an example, uh, I went through an interview and uh, the person interviewing me opened the thesis and they recognized a couple of people that they had worked with. So it was perfect because then I realized I had a network of people there that I didn't even think of. So they could connect and, you know, it, it became really nice. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Beate, you also wanted to say something to this uh, topic? Yeah, very briefly. I, I would like to endorse Teresa's point, not necessarily to apply for an entry level position. And especially for those people who have gained a lot of experience, especially say in the field of leadership. So if you have led a team, for example, these are qualities that are also very often uh, sought after in, in other more advanced level positions. So you needn't start right from scratch. Thank you. Um, uh, there is a related, since we've now been talking about CVs and how to use them, etc. There is a related question uh, about what if you have uh, holes in your CV? Because uh, some of uh, the uh, researchers at risk uh, have experience where they, for example, uh, were not able to continue their work in their home country uh, or were imprisoned or, uh, you know, there could have happened things that you might not like to put on your CV. Uh, but uh, how this is particularly to Kenneth, I think, uh, from the employer side, how do employers look upon this and what can you do about uh, these topics? Okay, so th there's one problem that I suspect may be there and then I'll talk about a solution that can help resolve the problem. One of the problems is that large companies receive so many CVs, they rely on artificial intelligence programs to scan CVs. And if they detect year gaps or more, you know, larger gaps, they will filter them out. Um, I mean, it de and that kind of problem is likely to happen. I mean, there are some roles, I'm sure I've certainly seen some roles where they're, you know, say 400 applications for one role someone has to start filtering CVs somehow. Um, I What I think is particularly helpful to get around this is, I can't emphasize enough the value of being able to have one conversation with a real person who works in that company. So what I call cold CV application, I accept. I mean, I've done it myself on that. You know, we do what we have to do, and other people have had much more straightened circumstances than I can ever imagine. And cold CVs are essential there. But I can't, you need to think about your network. Is the one person you've met or a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend who has worked there or is working there, that can help you use a personal email to say, listen, there will be this issue I'd like to talk about um, because of what happened in my home country. Here's what's, what's resulted in me. Most employers that I've come across that I know about, but then again, I'm, I'm in a pretty fortunate position of working in the you know, uh, high income EU country. A really understanding of that, really understanding of it. So I understand this a little bit as a twofold thing. So one thing is that you maybe put something so you have every something in your CV for every year, 
And yeah. the other one is to be able to explain to someone uh, more in depth actually what, what it was if about you, and, say, and networking. Yeah, say yeah. I was on sabbatical or say I had to take a pause, yeah. like fill in the line for the year. Yeah. yeah. So just that the, the computer won't see it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, there is another question about how can networking help support job applications? And I think we saw an example of this in what uh, Kenneth just said. Uh, but this is also something if someone uh, of you want to uh, say something on that, uh, that would be great. But first, Nina, you wanted to say something maybe on the last question. Yes, well, I just wanted to add, and this might shift from context and culture, but in my own experience, uh, for example, I, I would not find a gap that has to do with a parental leave a good gap. Rather, I would like there to be parental leave as a skill and experience, as a knowledge, uh, and as a broadening of a person's uh, maturity and, and facts of life. Uh, I, um, when I was head of department, I, I constantly tried to argue that parenting is a, is a, a two people thing, uh, ideally at least, and uh, that I'd expected both fathers and mothers to be on parental leave. We have a particular situation in Sweden, obviously, where we have good parental leaves, but it goes a bit with Kenneth uh, saying that uh, the employers aren't understanding, but there are also things sometimes when there are gaps that may, may that give you an experience that um, is actually a very uh, a deep and broad experience that you don't need to hide. Yeah, another uh, participant actually asked, um, what about age? Uh, how about age? Does industry accept people in late 30s? And I'm not sure if uh, we think then late 30s would be uh, too old or too young, <laughs> but I suppose. Uh, this is uh, based on the age of the one who asked. Uh, would anyone like to answer to this one? No. Uh, I maybe moved, can... I moved in, I moved into Accenture when I was forty-four. Um, I had been in industry beforehand, but my move to Accenture I was forty-four. Yeah. I, um, I have a friend of mine who is has a really good physics program behind him as working as a researcher and he's 52 and I think he's going to make the move and become a programmer in the industry. Yeah. Uh, Beata? I think we, we also see a positive impact on um, of anti-discrimination laws in many countries and any organization or a company that is suspected to discriminate people, say for age re reasons, can, can face a problem. Uh, of course, that's, that might be the, the difference between the theory and practice. However, I mean, we're also in, in some areas desperately searching for high quality people. So um, I, I think it is essential not to discriminate oneself by thinking, oh, I'm too old or I do not have that and that competency. But, you know, exploring opportunities by getting in touch with people, as has been previously stated, who might be part of the company or also by submitting spontaneous applications can sometimes be very useful. And if you can really try to, to treat your, your career gap, which might have occurred due to being a researcher at risk, uh, as open as, as you feel like treating it by saying, you know, relocation because of the political situation in my country or so, because that explains a lot and also shows your resilience not to forget. Yeah, I think the last point there is uh, quite important, actually. Um, OK, uh, we still have a number of uh, questions unanswered. Actually, more at the beginning, um, I got a question that was, um, I think, uh, maybe to Mehmet, but maybe also more generally to the others. Uh, how do you find time and ability to manage language learning, take care of your family? and look for work at the same time. Uh, I, I can see that uh, Teresa can maybe also relate to this, but uh, I, I'm open for several people to answer here. Mehmet? Uh, may I start? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, of course, uh, it's hard to, you know, uh, learn a new language uh, because you are working and you have a family and you have to learn a new language. Uh, and yeah, I did it at the evenings, yeah, because 
uh, and I'm still doing it. I have to learn a new language. Yeah, I'm 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 studying Swedish while I'm traveling in the in the metro and travel. Yeah, you know, traveling in the bus. So uh, it takes time, and I I I try to do it in my free times. But of course, I have a family, and it, it's not easy. Yeah, and it takes time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I could also, I, I'll uh, give you the floor uh, soon, Teresa. I just want to add that some of the host institutions would also be able to provide language courses uh, and also some other uh, courses to um, be uh, ready to, to move to new career steps during a fellowship uh, or position with, for researchers at risk, because this is kind of the purpose of the position is that you should actually be able to continue your career. Then it's Teresa and then Nina. Yes, yeah, so as I already mentioned, for me, it was very difficult to, to fit in to learn a language when I was doing the PhD on the, on the other activities. One thing actually that was recommended by me by, by the academy where I was, you know, you, you do an exam uh, to see sort of what your level is. My listening was terrible and they recommended me to just listen to the radio, listen to podcasts, kind of remember that we have also this passive ability to learn. And I, I didn't believe in it, but it really was probably what helped me the most. I would just, okay, whatever comes in, comes in, and whatever doesn't, doesn't. Just as uh, Mehmet said in the transport, maybe playing these Duolingo games with the app or listening to the radio, trying to watch maybe TV with subtitles, it really helps. Then maybe you can start to read a book or something. So you don't need to really think that, okay, I need to sit down now and study for three hours straight. Uh, these small steps help. And one important thing also is that I also thought that my Swedish needs to be perfect for me to get a job. And that's also not the case. I was very surprised because I never dared to take that first step to take the first conversation on the phone with someone in Swedish. They're very open. I mean, what they really need is that you're able to communicate first with your colleagues and so forth. I'm still writing my reports in English, for example. Maybe emails I can choose, but you know, don't think that you need to be perfect uh, from the beginning. Just taking those steps help. And then once you start working in the language, you will develop so much faster. OK, then uh, Nina, you would like to comment? Yeah, I'd like, actually, because I think that this is, even though it's really a key issue, it is, as we've heard, really difficult. And in Sweden, it is difficult because people switch to English very easily. Uh, I'm actually right now based in Germany, and that happens also here. So when I try to improve my German, um, even in the shop, they start speaking English to me because my German is not good enough. So uh, really, I'd like to stress the, the way in which you can have podcasts and radio. But if you have children and you, uh, you also feel that your, your time is taken up by children, and the kids are going to the a local kindergarten or listen to, to, to programs, try, try to make that an opportunity. Kids are extremely fast in, in learning and they can also be your key to, to training. Uh, but to also try to force your context, if you're still at some place and you wanna move, uh, ask them not to switch over lunch um, if you want to learn. Ask them, sit with Swedish or other where you are right now, where you're going from and to, and, and, and try to practice. And really, as Teresa was saying, don't, don't um, well, don't give up, as Mehmet was saying, but also don't feel it, to not be perfect. Uh, the, the, the key thing is to be able to improve your communication, really. Thank you. Uh, of course, we should have had uh, the kind of time switcher as they have in Harry Potter, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we only have 25 hours, not 24 hours uh, in a day. Uh, so um, there have been some questions connected to uh, networking and uh, how networking can help you uh, get a new job. And I was thinking of uh, often we, we have to explain very carefully about how higher education institutions, particularly public higher education institutions, have to have a very open and transparent uh, process in hiring and also very time consuming process that takes uh, maybe months. Uh, so if you want to apply for uh, positions there, you need to really plan in a very long uh, time. 
Maybe some of you could say a little bit about, more about uh, the hiring process in uh, private companies, because I think this can differ from something that is similar to what you see in public sector to something that is much more uh, almost through uh, friends and, uh, and networks. And uh, how can the researchers at risk prepare for this in a, in a good way? Anyone who wants to say something on this? I might just begin by saying, yep. like, in except, like for high skill roles, there's usually an awful business phrase. They'll use phrase like "war for talent," which is a phrase that makes, Ugh, but it's it, it's a very common business phrase. And um, for high skill roles, it's so hard to find people that they will rely on recruitment agencies. And in some cases, I don't think Accenture does, but in some cases, they will pay up to thirty percent of the first year salary as a finding fee for good applicants. So I think this thing that's really interesting, the academic job market is is always tight. Industry job market for some skills is always very, very powerful at hoovering up new talent, always looking for them, always, always. I myself, if I find someone for a role, I will get a bonus. If I find someone, I get a bonus. Now, again, this varies for the kind of roles that we have um, across organizations as well. But I can't emphasize enough, you need to be able to say when you're when you're going for a role that what you know is helpful and relevant to that business. And you need to understand the fact that they are effectively two different cultures. So your university system is one culture and your work system is another. You need to understand that you can, going back to this idea, that you can speak that language. And networking is one way of finding that out. You can talk to people who were, A, from your ethnic, ethno-religious or ethno-national diaspora. B, people who went to your university. So there's two networks. I mean, I'm Irish. So Irish people have long relied on uh, an ethno network in North America in order to try and find out where they can get work. Um, it's very common through Irish history to do this. So where those things are less relevant, finding someone who's been in your university and using alumni networks wherever possible is really helpful. But having that conversation about what, what do you need? What is your company going through? What are your major issues now? Um, is, that's rarely written on a website. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this? Yeah, Beate. Um, I think it might also make sense to, to find out what are professional uh, organizations in the field that you might be interested in. To give an example, in the field of research management, there is the European Association of Research Managers and Administrators, and they, they are also running workshops and, and organizing conferences. And if you try to get in touch with such institutions and see whether you could attend a meeting or so, it might also be a good opportunity to A, get an in-depth insight into the field and also link with other people. So that might also be a way to proceed. Yeah. So it, when we say networking, we actually mean networking in so many different uh, ways that it's almost only your imagination that can uh, be the border of, the, of this. Uh, when it comes to um, the social media networking, uh, I think it was mentioned by Mehmet maybe about uh, using uh, LinkedIn. Uh, are there other uh, such networks that you would uh, suggest or is this like the main thing people should uh, go to for uh, the online uh, way and also uh, I suppose from what Kenneth said earlier that to contact actually some of these uh, recruitment companies uh, and put up your CV there etc would also be another way uh, in addition to those more personal uh, networks. I find using Twitter is very helpful. The idea of being able to find someone, like I, so my background, I would be now in behavioral science. There are associations of behavioral science. They're not quite the full professional associations, but they will run webinars or seminars on topics. And you, you get a chance to talk to people that you otherwise would never have. Um, being able to get into those organizations, they're, they're loose collectives. They're not run with a charter, but they are very good ways of finding out live problems on the ground yeah uh, there is a question from one of the uh, speakers that is a little bit different they ask if um, uh, 
uh, is there a way that Inspire Europe can play a role in bridging a connection uh, between the scholars at risk and local institutes in the EU? And um, I, I'm not sure if anyone in this panel would uh, have any answer to this, but uh, I think we can say that the Inspire Europe project is uh, trying to bring together uh, different sectors, different players, uh, institutions, etc., so that we can have this kind of a conversation uh, that make it possible uh, to also open some doors. Uh, so that was for this uh, question. Uh, we don't have this particular like uh, matching, but there are networks that are partners in uh, Inspire Europe uh, that are uh, helpful in this area. Uh, now I think we should just leave for a short uh, like final comment for uh, from each uh, speaker to, to say your last advice for those who are now sitting and thinking of what should I do now to uh, move on with my next career steps. And I think we can take the same order as we did before. So we will start with Teresa. Thank you. So one thing that um, I thought of now as we were discussing and about the recruiters is that actually sometimes these recruiting recruiting firms they themselves at least here in sweden i'm not sure in other places in europe but they they also serve as consulting firms so that they they can actually employ you and then you will be a consultant and you can maybe be placed in different roles different companies and i think that for someone that doesn't have a very very clear view of how to enter into the private sector or what kind of role that they would like to do. This could be a, a very good opportunity to get there because that's another form of networking as well, because you that will be how you're contacting other companies and getting to know people there. So, so that's just another piece of advice for those that don't have a very clear view on, on how to move forward. Yeah, I think that was a good uh, good idea and it will actually be a little bit similar to going on an internship actually because you will maybe yes. be hired there for three weeks uh, but sometimes it ends up being your life career uh, until the end. Uh, okay then uh, Mehmet. Okay. Uh, lastly I would like to say about um, the network yeah, because uh, unfortunately, I have to talk about this. Yeah, in in Sweden, yeah, on the paper there is no uh, discrimination, ethnic discrimination. Yes, on the paper, no. But unfortunately, in the reality, I, I felt it. I, I've, I've been feeling it too much. Yeah, while I was looking for a job, uh, I'm sure uh, because of my name or because of uh, you know my ethnicity. Uh, my CV, I have really feel that my CV was not checked and was not on the table. And my network helped me at least to be my CV on the table. So network is very, very important. Uh, that, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, Kenneth is the next one. Um, take a piece of paper and use LinkedIn or use your family connections or use friends or friends of friends and find two people who have a similar training for you, who no longer work in academia, but work in industry and try and find out via a Zoom coffee with them, how they did it and what work they do Monday to Friday. Good, very concrete advice. Thank you. And then Nina is the next one, your last comments. Well, it, it connects to Kenneth. Uh, we, we've been discussing STEM backgrounds versus social science and humanities. Uh, society is filled with people, people who have a training in the humanities and social sciences. It just doesn't show, but most of them are not, doesn't, do not remain in academia. They've gone into public and private sectors with their skills and uh, so can you. Okay, thank you. And then Beate? Well, I think we haven't talked about one option that is also in, in place that, that, I'm, that I'm also representing, namely to, to found your own company and being an entrepreneur. I think, of course, this also comes with a lot of risks. Um, and I wouldn't advise somebody, you know, to immediately start from scratch. But um, if you should be, if you might be interested and, and discover that you also have this entrepreneurial ambition, meaning that you are interested 
you know, um, to set your own agenda, um, that you're prepared to, to take a certain risk uh, also in, in, in an economic sense, you might start doing an outside activity, maybe in parallel to your academic uh, trajectory and see if that works. And if it seems to work, then you can dare maybe also form an alliance with others in, in a similar field um, to see whether this, this might work out. So that, that is uh, my first recommendation. And the second, uh, building on what Mehmet highlighted before, I, uh, I perfectly understand that you might feel unhappy if, you're, if you have to, uh, to leave academia. But I wonder if it really means you need to leave it for good. We see, for instance, in, in universities of applied sciences where they're really searching for people who have gained practical experience and that might also kind of um, include the opportunity to return to academia in a wider sense. Um, so I, I wouldn't see that as a unidirectional uh, decision because there, there are clearly also a ways how, to, how one could get back into academia. Although somehow uh, not always in, in the narrow sense of the ivory tower. Thank you, Beate. I think we got a lot of uh, good like last uh, comments uh, here. And I think it's very obvious that um, the work that has to be done, you have to kind of um, try to be uh, the pilot in your own uh, work here and use uh, all opportunities and not be shy. Um, the Inspire Your project uh, has been working lately on a guide on next career steps. Uh, it will not only talk about moving into the private sector, but it will also uh, go into areas connected to uh, finding uh, work in uh, academia, searching for external funding, etc. We hope to have it ready and publish it uh, early in 2022. And I think um, there you will also find some advice, but you will also see the same thing that you have to do a lot of investigating and asking and finding um, different uh, solutions yourself. Uh, one thing that was not mentioned here is I think uh, if you go into the EU platform, uh, Eurexcess, uh, they have a lot of things that can be useful in the area you're talking about next career steps, or both in the area of finding out who you are and what you want and what is important and, and so on. They have tools, uh, but also in finding uh, companies and uh, institutions that could be relevant uh, places to work. Uh, so the URXS uh, website could be very useful. Uh, I just want to share at the end of this, um, at the end of this uh, session, um, uh, just some uh, contact details for the project uh, here. Sorry. Um, so uh, we have a website uh, and we will have more webinars. Uh, among the topics uh, that we are uh, thinking about uh, is to have a webinar on how to use uh, Rasmus Plus uh, staff exchange as uh, an opportunity to do more networking and maybe have internships uh, in other places. Uh, and also we'll have a specific uh, webinar uh, for um, uh, Greece and uh, Southeast uh, Europe. Uh, we will also have a stakeholder forum during the spring semester. Uh, and um, we have a mailing list where you will see all opportunities that are uh, coming up. Uh, you will also um, be able to um, fill in an evaluation form after the webinar. I hope you will do that. And um, then I think uh, what is left now is to thank all our uh, speakers who shared so much information with us and so many tips and tricks. Uh, and I hope some of you picked up something that will really help you uh, go further with your search for next career steps. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.